Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you, Beauty and the Beast. Perhaps only in movies can women be assassins or hired soldiers. In real life, 8 out of 10 criminals are men, according to statistics. If women do commit violent acts, they usually do so as accomplices or instigators. Alongside the elderly, disabled, and minors, women often appear as victims. They differ from men not only physiologically, but also psychologically. The behavior of the male half of humanity is aggressive and provocative, unlike that of women. Women are more gentle, emotional. They enter a state of hypnosis more easily, are more quickly and strongly affected by anesthetics and psychoactive substances, are more prone to depression, and are more susceptible to deceit and manipulation. A woman is always guided by love, compassion, creation. However, their aspirations are not always shared by the partners they choose for life. This leads to a confrontation of two principles, often destructive for the weaker party in the relationship. Whenever something extraordinary happens, such as a disappearance or a crime against life, the entire city or even the country empathetically follows the developments especially if the crime is publicized and the potential criminal shows no remorse for their actions. This is a story about another mysterious crime against a young woman that shook Orange Beach, Alabama, USA, on the calendar May 19, 2016. The police chief informed Gary Bardwell, the father of the missing Jesse, of the long-awaited news. I'm sorry, sir, he began. Today will be a difficult day for your family. Unfortunately, we do not expect to find your daughter alive, but we know where she might be. A team of detectives along with FBI agents set out for a remote ranch in Farmersville, North Texas. The group arrived in the evening and immediately went searching. In the wooded area, law enforcement officers stumbled upon a piece of metal covering something. There was an unbearable smell of decay nearby. However, those who arrived were prepared not only for this, but also for what caused it. Indeed, on the other side of the shield lay a female body, wrapped in a blue sheet. The corpse was covered with a blanket and two red-gold towels with bloodstains. A pile of trash mixed with dirt became the improvised gravestone for the unfortunate. It was clear that the perpetrator was an amateur, as trying to hide the result of their actions, they made it more noticeable. The condition of the body was terrible. After a week under the scorching sun, it had significantly decomposed. Experts needed seven days to officially identify the victim. For this, dental records of the presumed victim were requested. As the investigation suspected, the discovered body belonged to 27-year-old Jesse Bardwell. The examination showed that the young woman's death was the result of a crime. However, the exact cause could not be determined as the body was too decomposed. Notably, an unknown informant pointed to the location of the woman's remains. Their name was not disclosed until the end. Jessie Bardwell, a beloved daughter and friend, seemingly vanished from the home she shared with her boyfriend named Jason Lowe. Sensing trouble, Gary set off from Mississippi to Texas in search of his child. His instincts were correct. His girl had indeed been in danger for quite some time. But let's start from the beginning. It must be said that the father-daughter relationship was exceptionally strong. Gary recalled being deeply moved at the moment of Jesse's birth. She was so fragile and vulnerable that his heart melted and never belonged to him again. Jesse was born on September 10, 1988, in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Gary and Carla Bardwell were wonderful parents, and besides their daughter, they raised a son named Brandon. The siblings got along well, with the older brother always protecting his little sister from bullies. Grandma Kitty, who adored her grandchildren, was a frequent visitor. She read books to them, shared life stories, and invented various games. In short, they were the quintessential American family. Jessie herself was a joyful, cheerful, and kind girl. She had a unique style that set her apart from her friends. She dreamed of making it in the beauty industry and opening her own salon. When Jesse was 14, the family unit broke down. The Bardwells divorced. When it came time to choose whom to live with, the girl chose her father. Their relationship was warm and trusting. 
Gary worked as a firefighter, so Jesse often called him to check on him and ensure everything was fine. Over time, the man remarried. However, the stepdaughter and stepmother got along well. Gina was an excellent homemaker and took care of everyone in the household. Jesse understood that her father was happy and not alone with such a woman by his side, which was very important to her since she would eventually leave the nest. After finishing school, Jesse decided to become independent, so she moved to Orange Beach, Alabama. To support herself, she worked as a waitress at the popular beachfront restaurant Cobalt. Gary remembered how she loved being near the water. It calmed her. Father and daughter kept in constant touch, exchanging messages. When he visited, they would go boating and fishing. Kimberly Esbury, the restaurant manager and Jesse's friend, learned that Jesse's father was a talented musician. Upon retiring, he devoted more time to his passion, honing his skills. As a result, he was often invited to perform at the establishment and even had his own table there. Kimberly later admitted to admiring the relationship between Jesse and her father. They were true friends. Jesse was always present at his performances. The tips she earned went towards college and her dream. At work, she met a young man named Terry Ellis, also a waiter. They started dating after some time. Their relationship was steady and serious. They seemed like a harmonious couple. However, at one of the social events, Jesse was taken by his friend Jason Lowe. Her sudden infatuation surprised everyone. It seemed she was head over heels in love with him, oblivious to everything else around her. After explaining her sudden feelings, Jesse and Terry parted as amicably as they had met. Nonetheless, this decision turned her life upside down by 360 degrees. The new boyfriend was undoubtedly handsome and promising. He had two degrees and a decent job. Jason knew how to present himself and was polite. However, for Jesse, the new feelings were also a ticket to a new life. When he heard about his beloved's dreams, he promised to fulfill them. Eventually, the young man needed to transfer to Dallas, Texas. Then, Jesse followed him. The new position in the technology industry promised Jason a high-paying job. Kimberly shared that Jesse saw the move more as an adventure than something that could fundamentally change her life. She certainly didn't want to part with her father for long and hesitated for a while. However, ambition and youthful idealism prevailed. She did all this in secret from Gary. She was very afraid of disappointing her father, knowing he would be against it. Therefore, she didn't tell him even when they spent their last Christmas together. Mr. Bardwell noticed nothing unusual in his daughter's behavior. She was as happy as usual, laughing and joking. So, the 24-year-old found herself in Richardson, a suburb of Dallas. Jason worked from home, while Jessie searched for a new job and scouted locations for her salon. The couple planned to marry and buy a house. However, Jessie's relationship with her father underwent a drastic change. They grew distant. The daughter stopped answering his calls. Mr. Bardwell was troubled by this uncharacteristic behavior. After speaking with Kimberly, he learned about Jessie's new boyfriend and her move to another state. Ultimately, the man accepted the news and tried to re-establish contact. That's when he discovered that Jason controlled all communications. The only way to speak with Jessie was to call her boyfriend or the home phone. After each attempt, Jason would say she'd call back. Eventually, Jessie did indeed get in touch with her father. Months later, Gary finally met the suspicious young man in person when the couple visited Pascagoula. The father tried to convince his daughter not to return to Texas. He had a strong dislike for Lowe. That time, Jessie hugged him tighter than usual. When Gary asked if everything was okay, she said it was fine. She expressed her desire to make them proud, hence her need to leave. Persuading Jesse otherwise was impossible. Despite never showing signs of distress, her father had a bad feeling. After meeting with her, he wrote a song titled Taken, dedicated to his daughter. Four months after moving to Texas, she stopped responding to calls altogether. The final straw came on May 8th when she failed to wish her mother and stepmother a happy Mother's Day, uncharacteristic of her. Gary sensed something terrible had happened, 
especially since she missed such a cherished family holiday. He called Jason, who claimed he didn't know Jesse's whereabouts. The boyfriend mentioned they were in an open relationship, allowing her to come and go as she pleased. Gary knew this to be false. Jason contradicted himself. He was very jealous and controlled every move. The next morning, the father headed to Texas, convinced of the boyfriend's involvement in his daughter's disappearance. En route, he messaged Low, If Jesse isn't home when I arrive, you're in big trouble. Upon reaching their apartment, he found no trace of his daughter or her belongings. Yet, the boyfriend persisted he was unaware of her location and awaited her return. Later, Kimberly shared details Jesse confided during their rare heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Apparently, Jason squandered money on prohibited substances and entertainment. His promises to fulfill the girl's dream evaporated. Largely, the boyfriend pretended to be someone he wasn't. This extended to his treatment of Jesse. Publicly, their relationship appeared one way, but in private, Jason could be rude and aggressive, leading to frequent conflicts between them. With Jesse missing from the house, Gary filed a missing person report with the Richardson police. Detective Hiron Hale, a father of three daughters, led the investigation into her disappearance. The man was determined to uncover the truth. Law enforcement officials acted immediately. They spoke with Lowe several times and inspected the house, but found no trace of the missing woman. During the conversation, the young man mentioned that he last saw her on May 8th around 10 a.m., leaving without explanation, possibly to visit her parents. He saw her get into her Acura car and drive away. Jason kept insisting that despite strong feelings, their relationship was non-committal. He claimed he didn't control her or pry into her personal life. However, investigators received information contradicting his statements. It turned out Jesse had sold her car three weeks earlier, a fact he surely knew since he was present at the sale. This raised questions for the investigators, prompting them to interrogate him again. On May 12th, during a subsequent search of his home, police found a strip of powder on a plate in the kitchen. The substance turned out to be cocaine. The investigation then focused on Lowe's garage and the vehicle inside it. Initially resistant, citing the garage was shared and needed others' permission for a search, Lowe eventually ceased his objections. Upon entering, officers immediately noticed a smell characteristic of crime. Jason Lowe's Audi was mud-splattered, and its bumper was detached. Police suspected that Jesse Bardwell might be inside the car. Although the vehicle was empty, the smell of decomposition intensified. Inside, they found the broken bumper and what appeared to be bloodstains in the trunk. When experts sprayed a luminol-based substance, the cargo area lit up with blue light blood, presumably belonging to the missing woman. Jason explained he got stuck in the mud while searching for his girlfriend, catching the bumper on a bush. He remained adamant about not knowing her whereabouts. He could not explain the blood in the car or the presence of controlled substances in his home. Experts concluded the amount of blood in the trunk indicated the woman was deceased. Given the circumstances, the case was reclassified as a homicide. To prevent the main suspect from fleeing, he was detained on charges related to the narcotic substances. During interrogation, Lowe persisted in his narrative. When shown a photo of his loved one, he refused to provide explanations, looking emotionlessly at the picture and suggesting he was being framed for something he didn't do. Eventually, despite the absence of a body, the suspect was charged with homicide. As the search for the young woman continued, a challenging and lengthy process in the vastness of Texas, with its many rivers, lakes, fields, and forests, where a body could easily be concealed. Her family, friends, and sympathetic acquaintances held a memorial service. The event took place on the beach by the water Jesse loved. Everyone prayed for her to be found and for justice for her suffering. Their prayers were answered on May 19th when Jessica Bardwell was found deceased. Her loved ones at least had the chance to mourn her and say goodbye. Gary felt it necessary to review his daughter's autopsy report. He was appalled that his girl, wrapped in a sheet and barely recognizable as a human, was discarded like trash. 
Her body was returned to her hometown thanks to Gary's friends. Former colleagues hired and loaded Jesse into a funeral hearse. About a thousand people visited the First United Methodist Church to pay their respects to the victim. Kitty Bardwell, Jesse's grandmother, confessed, If this town could be cleansed with the tears shed for Jesse, it would truly be clean. The tragedy that struck their family garnered widespread attention, with many expressing sincere condolences for their premature loss, coming forward to support the Bardwells. A year had passed. Gary sat in McKinney Jail in Texas, still reluctantly cooperating with the investigation. However, two facts regarding Jesse's case were eventually extracted from him. Firstly, he claimed what happened to her was an accident, planning to reveal the details in court, hoping for the jury's understanding. This made it challenging for the prosecution to build their case during the trial, much to the delight of Andy Farkas, Lowe's attorney. Farkas staged a mock trial with outsiders acting as jurors. Based on the available evidence and Jason's confession, the mock trial regarding Jessica's case fell apart. Fifteen pseudo-jurors decided to acquit Lowe. Farkas hoped that knowing the truth, a real court would also deliver a not guilty verdict. Remember the anonymous tip about the victim's body location? It turned out that information came from Jason himself. This became another piece of evidence obtained during the investigation. The prosecution offered a deal to reduce his sentence by half if he disclosed Jesse's location. After deliberation and consultation with his lawyer, he agreed, requesting that the source of the information remain confidential until the trial. The deal was motivated by law enforcement's desire to allow Jesse's family to say goodbye and bury her body humanely. As time went on, the grief-stricken father longed for justice. To quell his raging fury, he once decided to take a unique approach. Gary printed a photo of Jason, placed it on a stump, and pounded it with a 12-pound sledgehammer. This form of psychological therapy offered him some, albeit small, relief. Mr. Bardwell confessed to struggling to get out of bed in the mornings living with the hope that Lowe would soon face trial and be convicted for the murder of his only daughter. He blamed himself for what happened, regretting not convincing his daughter to stay or at least break up with her controlling boyfriend. Jesse once called her father, admitting he was right after arguing with Jason, who had kicked her out. She was sheltered by a new friend, but returned to her boyfriend the next day, giving him another chance. Gary had no choice but to accept his daughter's decision, a choice he would deeply regret later. When the trial finally began, Mr. Bardwell arrived in Texas, determined to achieve just punishment. Prosecutor Cynthia Walker began her opening statement by characterizing Jason. Most viewed him as a complex personality with few friends, mostly avoided due to his long history with controlled substances, often leading to uncontrollable rage. Perhaps Jesse was caught in one of these moments. Prosecutor Wes Wynn called Lowe's former girlfriends as witnesses. They confirmed the prosecution's claims about his aggression, sharing fears for their lives due to his jealousy-driven violence. Like with Jesse, he isolated them from family and friends, displaying clear manipulative and pathological lying traits. Hence, each ended their relationship, which was no easy feat, requiring caution and cunning. Conversely, Lowe showcased his superiority among men, effectively pulling the wool over people's eyes. Jason quickly responded to these court revelations. He disclosed starting substance use at 13, influenced by friends, leading to addiction. Nevertheless, he strived to not lose his way in life, achieving multiple degrees and working for a renowned global company. Lowe confessed his desire to fulfill Jesse's dream out of love, aiming to build a family with her. In contrast, the prosecution painted a picture of a man far from someone who had recently lost his beloved, and here's why. The investigation determined that the young woman's demise occurred between May 1st and May 3rd, presumably on the day when the Jordans, the couple's neighbors, last saw her alive. Following an argument that led to Jesse's demise, Jason moved her body to the garage and placed it in the trunk of his car, where it remained for several days. 
the blood traces found in the Audi indeed belonged to Jesse. He later transported her body to a remote farm and concealed it in the nearby woods. It was established that the sheet wrapping the body was part of Lowe's bedding set, which was still found in his home. Fearlessly using it even after Jesse's death, while her body was decomposing in the car, the accused continued to see other women. His phone was filled with corroborative messages and intimate photos, which he sent to these women before meeting them at his apartment. Jason explained that he was trying to distract himself and forget, often indulging in substance use, claiming it made dealing with reality easier. The investigation learned of Jason's presence at Jesse's time of death through a clever manipulation. As the suspect had long denied involvement, detectives asked Tommy Jordan, an acquaintance, to speak with Jason. During their monitored conversation, Lowe admitted he messed up and made a mistake, confessing to an unfortunate accident with Jesse and his guilt, albeit for criminal negligence. Law enforcement took this as a confession. Realizing the investigation was on to him, Jason struck a deal with the prosecution and disclosed the body's location. At the trial, he finally shared his version of events. That evening, he and Jesse took pills that enhanced libido and then became intimate in the shower. At one point, Jason slipped, followed by Jesse, who hit her head on the porcelain bathtub. She then sat down, complaining of feeling hot and dizzy. Jason claimed he offered to call an ambulance, but Jesse refused, suggesting rest and sleep would suffice. However, he found her unconscious the next morning, lying on his chest without breathing. Despite his attempts to revive her, Jesse was dead. Fearing being accused of homicide, he hesitated to call the police and decided to act on his own, initially leaving the body in his car. Days later, he resolved to hide the body on a remote farm, where he carelessly disposed of his former lover in a pile of trash without a proper burial. His story might have been believable if not for the defendant's character and the forensic medical examination findings. The woman had suffered cranial injuries, which couldn't have resulted from slaps to the face, indicating Jason attempted to conceal evidence of a beating. Thus, his entire narrative was fabricated. After a six-hour deliberation, the jury found him guilty. Judge Scott Becker sentenced the criminal to 50 years in prison. The term could have been longer, up to 99 years, but was reduced due to Jason's deal with the prosecution as agreed. Lowe won't be eligible for parole until at least 2041. At the verdict announcement, Gary was relieved justice prevailed, yet he saw no remorse in the young man's eyes. Standing with the victim's father were Jason's ex-girlfriends. One, Chrissy Chambers, remarked that if she could say anything to Jesse, it would be, run, just save yourself. To this day, the convicted Lowe denies his guilt in the homicide, insisting it was an accident. The love of his life decayed in his car while he continued to live and entertain himself. Tragically, Jesse Bardwell saw the dark side of Jason Lowe too late. Daddy's girl hadn't realized how deceitful and brutal men could be, having always had a model of male integrity and care in her father Gary. Regrettably, scoundrels possess a peculiar charm, easily lying or embellishing to intrigue or enamor. This story is a cautionary tale that a woman must choose herself, her safety, and her freedom always and regardless. Otherwise, the story's end can be tragic not just for her, but for her entire family. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.